Okay, I want to welcome everybody to the uh, November 28, 2017 Board of Commissioners meeting. Uh, I guess not. It's like yelling in my teenagers yelling at me. Anyway, um, first of all, I want to talk uh, a brief um, uh, note of personal privilege. Um, uh, um, Commissioner Bob Weatherford will not be here tonight. Um, he has the uh, sad but um, the privilege and honor of escorting one of his fallen heroes to Canton National Military Cemetery today as part of the Patriot Guard. And uh, I want to, uh, tonight when we do our invocations, is a brief moment of silence for, for, uh, for this uh, fallen hero, uh, veteran of our country who defended our freedoms, and for all those at Canton tonight who are buried there along with their families. So with that, uh, we have uh, Detective Sheriff Florence Stevenson leading us in invocation. She's been with Cobb County for five and a half years. And she's negotiated for the SWAT team. And then we're really, really privileged tonight to have the Dickerson Middle School Percussion Ensemble leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. No, they can all come up. It's okay. All right, we're gonna we're gonna do the we're gonna do the invocation first, and then we'll do the pledge. All right. Officer right. Stevenson. Yeah, let me bow our heads. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for bl blessing us to see another day. Thank you for our county commissioner commissioners and those who were able to attend this meeting today. It is not by accident that we are here, but we ask for your wisdom, peace, and understanding this evening. Lord, bless everyone here and watch over them as they go home today. Lord, just have your way this evening in these things that we ask. Amen. Amen. Okay, the, the tallest gets to lead us in the pledge. That's you, young man. <laughs> yes. Bye, Tom. Ready? Okay. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You want to just leave them up here? We'll do the presentation. Okay. Why don't you just, you know, young men and ladies, just stay up here? Appearance. And we're going to go into our first presentation. What do you? Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, as you heard, this is the Dickerson Middle School Percussion Ensemble. Let me tell you a little bit about what they do. Uh, this is a proclamation. Whereas Dickerson Middle School Percussion Ensemble has received an invitation to perform at the prestigious Music for All National Percussion Festival in Indianapolis um, next March 15th through the 17th, and whereas the festival has recognized America's top high school concert bands and percussion groups since 1992 and began inviting middle school starting in 2008. This will be the third time that Dickerson Middle School Percussion Ensemble has been invited and will be the most appearances of any middle school percussion ensemble in the country. And whereas Dickerson Percussion Ensemble is recognized as one of the nation's finest middle school groups receiving invitations to perform and present clinics for numerous national and international music conferences, including the National Middle School Association Conference, the per Percussive Arts Society International Convention, the Sandy Felstein Music for All National Percussion Festival, and the Midwest International Band and Orchestra Clinic, and whereas the percussion ensemble will also perform for the Georgia Music Educators Association in-service conference in Athens this January on the 26th. The GMEA conference features performances by some of the state's finest ensembles. Students have shown tremendous dedication throughout the years to achieve these honors. Now, therefore, we, the Cobb County Board of Commissioners, do hereby recognize the outstanding dedication and achievements of the Dickerson Middle School Percussion Ensemble and wish them the best as they represent Cobb at the Music for All National Percussion Festival this 28th day of November. Now, there's some of the, uh, I see only middle schoolers here. Where are the teachers? I know you're here. Get up here. <laughs> Come on. And I think Scott's here too. Scott, are you coming up? 
You don't get to stand in the back. Now, I think the principal's here too, right? You get to come up here too. I'm not doing this by myself. All right, so here, I'm going to give you the, uh, the proclamation. And I'm going to let the principal help me over here. We have to read them all off. All right. You're not saying them correctly, right? I don't know. My assistant may. All right. Ethan Barnicki. We'll applause it. We'll do some applause at the end. Um, William Sederberg. Ellie Compton. We'll read one of these here in a sec. Courtney Cumberledge. Uh, Samir Honda. Clarissa Haynes. Jamie Hughes. Ryan Jacobson. Allison Colsar. Ryan Kelwitz. Did I say the right Kelwitz? Luke Labos. Jake Lager. Cynthia Pang. Evan Roberts. Cameron Peachman. Ling Tong, Samir Verma. So these are the eighth graders, and now for the seventh grade, Addison Augustine, um, Emily Bronsted, Davis Callahan. Catherine uh, Deerker. Benjamin Garner. Jasmine Goldie. Jackson Kelly. William Marcello. Max Nierjohn. Carolyn on Angara. <laughs> Levi on Nori. <laughs> Caitlin Stanton. <laughs> Caden uh, Sumsky. <laughs> Jacob Sweeney. Uh, it's got your double duty. Congratulations. All right, so I'm going to let uh, Dr. Brink, do um, you want to say a few words? I didn't know I was going to speak, but I can't tell you how proud I am of these students every single day. They excel in music and in academics, but above all, they excel in character. So I'm very proud of all of you. All right, guys, you got to kind of squeeze together up here. <laughs>
All right, our next group is equally successful, but in soccer. So if the uh, soccer players could come up with their coach. All right, you guys know the drill. So now before, um, before I let the coach have the mic, um, we need to know what happened on the 18th and 19th. Is that in your notes? Yes. Well, on All right, well. Yes. Uh, on the 18th and the 19th of this month, we were actually invited to the invitation-only Triumph Cup tournament. Uh, so I'll talk about that in a minute. Would you like me to say a few words about the team now? Yeah. Okay, great. And thank you, Commissioner Rob, for having us out, distinguished council members. Two of the people I want to thank that are not here are Mike Gaziano of the Smyrna Soccer Club for helping getting the team organized, and Paul Hoffman, who's president of the local referees and who sets the gold standard for all referees. But briefly, about the Smyrna Soccer Club Team Benfica, it's made up of 18 young men aged 14 to 15. They come from different schools and backgrounds, and many of them haven't played on the same team together before. As a coach, the priorities are safety, teamwork, and having fun playing soccer. As the team came together, we saw that there were no prima donnas, ball hogs, or glory hounds most of the time. So we saw that we would truly win or lose as a team. At practices, there was a lot of goofing around and jokes, but at game time, we showed them what Cop County was made of. Through these sons of Smyrna, Team Benfica has a lightning fast offense, a skilled and powerful midfield, and an iron wall of defense. On average, we scored over four goals per game while allowing one goal or less to be scored on us. This resulted in a rarely achieved undefeated season of 10 straight wins in a row. We were ranked against 78 teams in Georgia and finished the season as the number three team in the state. As I was starting to talk about, with our undefeated record, we were invited to the invitation-only Triumph Cup tournament held two weekends ago, the 18th and 19th, at the Wade Walker YMCA Park in Stone Mountain, where we made it to the finals and only lost in a shootout. So we showed that we could hold our own amongst the best of the best in Georgia. So in closing, I believe that I speak for Cobb County, City of Smyrna, Smyrna Soccer Club, all the team Benfica parents, Coach Mahmood and myself when I say how very proud we are of Team Benfica for their undefeated season and tournament performance. So I present to you Smyrna Soccer Club, Team Benfica.
All right, let's give one more uh, round of applause. <laughs> Well, it's always great to start out a meeting with uh, two uh, presentations of that nature, and it's good to see the, uh, the future America right there. <clears throat> okay, um, we did tabs one through four yesterday, one through five yesterday, and we just did tab six, so we're going to start at tab seven, which is your public comments. And we have how many speakers? You have 12 altogether, six for the beginning of the meeting and six for the end. Okay, so how do we want to handle this? Do all 12? Do all 12? Okay, we're going to do all 12. Okay. The first speaker is Mayor Bill Dunaway. You come forward. Can I say something? Sure. Yeah, of Go dogs. <laughs> Good evening. And Mr. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I don't normally speak from notes, but uh, I try to wing it. But tonight, the decision that the county is considering will greatly affect the square negatively as far as I'm concerned. So forgive me if I refer to notes every now and then. I'm going to try my best to finish in five minutes. If I don't make it, I hope you'll grant me a few more minutes to finish what I have to say. I know you all are facing a terrible deficit. And I, I know where you are. I know how you feel because in 2007, 2008, Marietta faced a terrible deficit with our recession. And we had to work hard and make some tough decisions. And we did everything. We balanced that budget without raising taxes. And we did it without hurting any businesses in Marietta. I hope that's what you will do tonight, not hurt any businesses in Marietta. You know, I can park my car. That makes me an expert on parking. No, not really. Parking is really an art form. It's more of a science. It's not simple math. I probably have more experience about parking on the square than anybody else in this room. You see, we moved here in 1943 when I was four years old. My father bought and ran a drugstore in the square. And I remember his fussing about the parking in the square in 1943. I fussed about the parking in the square all the time that I owned and ran that drugstore too. It always was a constant problem. But <clears throat> this situation about the parking deck is not a them and us. It's not the county versus the city. It's all of it is us. All the people in Marietta, all the businesses on the square, all this in Strand Theater pays just they all pay just as much in county taxes as if they were on Off Cell Road. Yes, the Strand Theater is a nonprofit, but it leases the property from a private individual. And by terms of the lease, the Strand pays full more city taxes and Marietta taxes. But I'm not here just on behalf of the Strand, though. Uh, but I just want to say, all these businesses also pay sales tax, liquor tax, inventory tax. And anything that the county does that will hurt the businesses on the square, hurts the, you hurt them yourselves. And it's a given fact, as far as I'm concerned, charging for parking at nights and on Saturdays will hurt the square. There's no doubt about that. Uh, you remember what the square looked like? Some years ago, in fact, I remember somebody referred to it as a Paulding County's Buckhead. And I'm from Paulding County, so I can say that. But now look at it. It's wonderful. It's vibrant. And I like to think the Strand had a little, little bit to do with that. The square is not just for the city. It's not just for the county. It's regional. And we're drawing people from all over the place. Now, I've heard a few arguments about, oh, well, the county should start paying for parking because... The city didn't pay for the new parking deck. No, the city didn't. We were in long negotiation 10, 11 years ago with the county when I was mayor. And for whatever reasons, and for many reasons, the county decided they did not need the city's help on the new parking deck. So no, we didn't pay for it. I say we because I consider myself part of the city. Another argument I've heard is that, well, there's a mess inside the parking decks on Monday morning and over the weekend. And the, 
city doesn't pay for cleaning it up. <clears throat> no, we don't. But you know, there's the best in Glover Park. And the city cleans it up. You know, there's more county residents come to the Marietta Square on any day than Marietta residents, county only, Marietta only. And the city pays for the maintenance and upkeep of Glover Park. The county doesn't pay for it, nor should they. The, uh, there was a fire here in the courthouse a couple of weeks ago. I'm glad it was a minor fire. But who responded? The Marietta Fire Department. Because the county has a protection of the Marietta Police Department and Fire Department on not just the courthouse, but all of it. But they don't pay for the support of the Marietta Police Department or Fire Department. That's fine. What I'm trying to say is as broad as it is long. Who pays for what? And I hope no accountant starts adding it up because it doesn't need to be that. <clears throat> but about 10 years ago, the Downtown Marriott Development Authority commissioned a study, a parking study, about parking on the square and the new parking deck. They came out with some very interesting proposals, frankly, none of which were taken, but they had some interesting proposals for the county about please don't charge a flat rate for the full day parking. Don't charge $5. So what do they do? You pull in at 9 o'clock in the morning, it's $5. You pull in at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it's $5. Do you pay $5 to pack, park for a couple of hours? No, you go park up on the square and ruin the parking for the merchants. I'm an old retailer. I learned a long time ago that if you charge less for some things, you'll end up getting more. And the recommendation was go to hourly parking and make the first 30 minutes free. You know, if you're coming come to the square and go to the courthouse just to pick up a document or get something signed, you're not going to pay $5 for a 20 to 25 minute trip. You're going to go to the square and run the parking up there. <clears throat> but for whatever reasons, the county did not follow it. One of the recommendations was to hire a parking management company. Now that costs money. And I don't know whether they should have hired them or not. And I'm not recommending that to y'all. But it's maybe something you should consider. KSU, which does, Kansas State, which does no management, hires a parking company to manage their parking. Wellstar, which knows management, hires somebody to manage their parking. And the tightest person in Cobb County, Philip Goldstein, hires a parking service to manage his, his parking. So maybe it's worth taking a look at. I don't know. But I really ask you, please delay this decision. Get with a parking consultant. You know, I saw one of the examples that y'all had. It was estimated that 1,000 cars will park at the parking deck every Saturday for the next 52 Saturdays. Really? No, they'll come to the square. They might pay at one time, and then they probably will not come back. This is the goose that laid the golden egg on the square. Please help it keep on with the revitalization and please delay it. Now, eventually, one of these days, the city and county are going to have to get together and they're going to have to go to manage parking for the surface parking, for the street parking, and for the decks. I did not say parking meters. That's a dirty word. I said managed parking. And that concept is too involved for my expertise to explain it to you. I can't explain it all to myself, but I hope you will seek out some parking consultants on this decision. And whatever you do, please don't hurt the square. Thank you very much. The next speaker is David Birkenbein. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Board, County Manager, David Birkin buying a medical burn van. I guess what I want is just to have the medical burn ban enforced. I was honored to go to 911 finally. And I really got enlightened. After spending two hours there, I found out that they don't have the list for the medical burn ban people. And after two hours, we've walked around and looked, and we have two firemen that dispatch the 911 calls for fire. And a gentleman that showed me around made a statement. He says, 
<clears throat> he says, well, they're coded. And then they can tell what they need to send out, what type of equipment. I said, oh, coded. Well, instead of being worried about the addresses and all this stuff, people moving, why can't we code the medical burn ban? People call up, I have a medical burn ban. And if it comes to 911 operator, it's going to go over to the two firemen that dispatch a fire truck. Let's say a code 050. Then have a protocol that you're going to check on the people that have a medical burn ban. But why in the world we do not enforce a medical burn ban when people call in and say, I have a medical burn ban, and they come out there and they see a fire pit, they see a chimney, they see this, they see that and they don't put it out. You have all this, all this right here with definitions of yard debris. You have definitions of recreational fires. You have safeguards and limitations on outdoor burning. And it means nothing to the people with medical burn ban. Why? Because you ain't gonna help them out. They filled out a form. They went, you know, they went through the system. So to protect these people, if it's going to be a deal on, on privacy, then when a person calls in with a medical burn ban and says, I have a medical burn ban, and it gets turned over to the 911 fire operator to dispatch fire, then code it and have protocols that they got to follow to go through and make sure these people are all right. And like I say, even though it was two years ago, I know from experience they don't check on you. So what we need to do is just fix it in the most easiest way possible. If you have a medical burn ban, you call, the fire department comes out, put it out. That's what you gave the people. It's, it's no if, ands, or buts about it. I mean, you have restrictions to outdoor burning, do not apply to the following. Then you have burning prohibitions. Then you have exceptions to the burning prohibitions. And on and on and on. And then we have our own interpretations of what we want to do. Sooner or later, we're going to hopefully come to an agreement or come to something because it's these people deserve more than what they're getting from the county the fire chief, the fire marshal. And just like the fire marshal, he told me it was a loophole. Well, last meeting it was, well, that was the best we could do. It was compromise. What compromise? You just, what, you just take these people and throw them away? You throw them off in the corner over here? You give them no fallback on the, if it affects them? But yet, if somebody has a, uh, use of property violation or quality of life violation, you'll put the fire out. I, I just, you know, this is life and death. This ain't a game. I mean, you know, we got to do something. Thank you. The next speaker is R.J. Grossman. Good evening. Uh, before I do go into my speaking of, uh, speech on spe speed limits, I do want to commend the mayor about the parking. My wife and I live in Clarkdale. I used to live in Canton. And we go to lots of events in Marriott in the evening and on weekends because the parking's free. We choose to go there as opposed to other places that we have to pay parking for. Uh, but I'm going to talk about what we're, uh, what I'm came for. I live in Clarkdale. And we, uh, Austell Powder Springs Road fronts Clarkdale. Powder Springs has a 35 mile an hour speed limit. Austell has a 35 mile an hour speed limit. What I'm looking for, for the safety of the residents of Clarkdale and people who drive on Austell Powder Springs Road, is a consistent 35 mile an hour speed limit. There's a stretch from where Powder Springs ends and when Austell begins, which is 45 miles an hour. What that road passes is Clarkdale Park. People walk to Clarkdale Park where there's no sidewalk and cars are speeding past. We also have two churches and a post office. Everyone who lives in Clarkdale does not get home delivery. We have to walk to the post office to get a delivery. 
And there's a crosswalk, a well-marked crosswalk. But people speeding around the curve, down the road, barely even think about it. Rarely people who might be in crosswalk, they don't even, they don't even stop, they honk. So ideally, a 35 mile consistent speed limit from Powder Springs or Estelle that's enforced will help slow down the traffic, allow the elderly and young people who have to use that crosswalk safely to walk to the post office. There's also a hairstylist there. The two churches on Sunday, people drive there. There are several drivers that front out to Austell Potter Springs Road, and when people are speeding down, it's hard to get in and out. It's a pretty sharp curve going in and going out, and even school buses are hard to see if you're going 45 miles an hour. And everybody kind of knows that the speed limit is 45. That means 55. At 35, it might be 40, 45. So time of changing the speed limit and consistent enforcement for 35 from Powder Springs to Austell, that would make it a lot easier for people who live in Clarkdale and travel through Clarkdale and that stretch road to be safely moving both on foot and by car. Also, if somebody will point me to the person or the procedure of how we move that along, I'd be happy to get that at the end of the meeting, if that's okay. First thing I'd recommend is you talk to your commissioner. Okay. Commissioner Cupid, and I'm sure she'll be able to help you on that issue. Thank you. Yes, sir. Excuse sure, me, Chairman. Go ahead. Yes. And in the meanwhile, we do have some staff from DOT here today, our okay. leadership there. I'm sure they'd be happy to um, discuss your request with you. And they're seated at the back of the okay. room. Yeah. And if you don't mind waving your hand so you can see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Larry Gore. I parked on the square too. It's free versus five dollars. No brainer, guys. Thank you for hearing me again. Uh, I was here uh, last month, I guess. I'll, I'll read this. Uh, thank you for hearing me, and thank you for working for us. That's sincere. Uh, people just like you have given their best and have brought Cobb County to the great place she is today. This is a follow-up to my 10-10-2017 grievance hearing. We have since then received a visual dam inspection from Bill Higgins, Stormwater Division Manager. I think he's a division manager. Anyway, he's the man that did the inspection. That I received via an open records request filed 10-29-2017. The report documents numerous defects in the existing a category two dam. Some note as some noted as disturbing. Lee McLeod is now in negotiations with the developer to construct our nature trail system. We did meet with Dana Johnson and some of his staff and they are working. I would like to follow up with a question. If during the regular duty of the functions and responsibilities of the staff at community development, or any other branch of Cobb government, one discovers, uncovers, witnesses, or observes the commission of a crime or any irregularity in the normal process, what are your expectations? What are your requirements? What is your policy and your protocol? Thank you. The next speaker is Pat Burns. Which is it? Uh, one, one second, ma'am. What, uh, excuse me, sir, what, what's your address of the dam, roughly? Okay, so, yeah, Commissioner Cupid knows about this, so she's, okay. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sorry about that. Good evening. My name is Pat Burns. I live in the Concord Covered Bridge Historic District. 
My mission tonight is to thank you and especially Cobb County's DOT <laughs> for the preservation of the covered bridge. The repairs and the restoration are nearly complete and you all have had a hand in making this happen. The covered bridge is the anchor to the historic district. It's Cobb County's first historic district. Your commission predecessors had the foresight to set aside this district with its battlefield and where the Battle of Ruff's Mill took place in 1894. Very few battlefields and old homes are preserved unblemished, unblemished by new construction and new homes. This historic district is the only one in the nation with a covered bridge, a mill, and pre-Civil War homes that still exist. So from the friends of the Concord Covered Bridge, I want to thank you and thank the DOT. Thank you. The next speaker is Randall Beggood. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman and uh, Commissioners. Uh, I'd like to come to you this afternoon to talk about free. Uh, a lot of people like free. And when you start talking about taking away free, then they get upset about it. Um, I know you're going to take up the parking tonight, and uh, I think that shouldn't be free. I think you should charge for the parking. Uh, if, uh, if you go anywhere else, just about, you pay for parking. You go to Wellstar, you pay for parking. Uh, you go to the fair, you pay for parking. So I don't see why Cobb County parking deck should be any different. The city of Marietta wants to work up some kind of deal with y'all so they can help you out on it, then that would be fine. I'm gonna leave the fee structure up to y'all. If you wanna charge a flat $5 fee, that's fine. If you wanna to go to some other fee, on the weekends where you uh, where you pay you know so much you know you get an hour free and then you pay for something for the rest of the time then that's that's fine too uh, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, well first off the Cobb County employees they have to pay for parking they work here and uh, uh, they uh, and when I came into the parking deck I went up to the third to the third level before I parked and I don't know what all those reserved spots are for. Um, I don't. I, I hope those people that have got reserved spots are paying for parking. Uh, they. Uh, the other thing I want to talk to you about is I know that the uh, that you passed the uh, funding to charities this year, and I know you felt like you were obligated to do that because you had more or less obligated yourself to it. But I think it's time you start weaning. <laughs> that program off. Uh, I don't think that the uh, charity should have been funded and the employees not get a raise. You've got some good employees here, but they begin, they begin to get uh, a little bit discouraged and a little bit of a bad morale. Uh, the employees, they, they deserve uh, credit for what they do and they deserve pay for what they do. Uh, there's uh, uh, a lot of good employees here, and uh, uh, I just think you should look out after them. And uh, I know this budget thing has come about, and uh, as far as you, uh, Chairman, I know it's not your fault. I know you inherited a bad situation. I think somebody just kept kicking the can down the road and uh, then everything came to a head. You couldn't get a uh, millage rate through. Uh, you had three commissioners that didn't see that. They'd rather use the reserve money. 
but the reserve money is not going to be enough money. And you can solve this whole problem with a millage rate. Uh, I'm not a kind of person that I expect anything for free. I've been here long enough on this earth to know that you might be pretty much paid for what you get. And I think that goes for government also. And uh, they, I just like you to take that in consideration. And uh, while I got a few minutes, if I run out of time, just let me know. But I know Mr. Weatherford has uh, proposed a 1% uh, sales tax for uh, the police department. I always thought sales tax was the fairest tax it was. If you didn't spend, you didn't pay. And I voted for the first two splices this county ever had. I never voted for another one. The splices have got to be just a slush fund. Uh, they were originally set up to be for needs. And we got out of the needs and got into the feel good stuff. And when you get into the feel good stuff, you do the feel good stuff, but then when you start supporting that feel good stuff, it's got to come out of the county budget and the money's not there and the people are not willing to raise the millage rate to pay for it. So uh, I think uh, uh, as far as putting a 1% sales tax on for the police department, there'd have to be a lot of accountability, a lot more than what's in the splice funds now because that's, that's something that can really be abused. And I just, I, just, I just wouldn't support that unless it was really a clear cut what that money was going to be spent for and how it's going to be spent. And he didn't say anything about the Sheriff's Department. The Sheriff's Department's got, uh, they got Mr. expenses Bevington, too. thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is John Cole. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is John Cole, and I work at Avery Gallery, which is just a short, short distance away on Wazzle Street. We have a slightly different take on the parking fee issue. We have customers that come to our gallery from all over Metro Atlanta and the Southeast, many times as far away as North Carolina, sometimes to make a day trip down here to restore their artwork. One of the key items that we promote is to come to the Marietta Square, eat lunch or dinner at one of the 28 plus restaurants we have around here, and then after they've traveled for several hours to see us. For those arriving later in the day, for example, you know, after three, four o'clock, we promote parking in the parking deck because it's free after hours. They can drop their paintings off with us, go to the square and eat and shop and before getting back on the road to head back home. And those who come to us on Saturdays, we're told about the free parking, special events, restaurants again, all that stuff that happens on Saturdays. Many have chosen to make day trips just to come to Marietta to enjoy all that we have to offer instead of just making a trip just to see us. In fact, just this evening, we had a customer drive up from Macon who picked up about 25 pieces of artwork that we stored after a house fire. They decided, because it was about 4.30, 4.45 by the time we got everything loaded, drive around a little bit and park around the square to come eat and do a little bit of shopping before they drive and try and drive back through Metro Atlanta at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. <clears throat> Many of our out-of-town customers also have a slightly higher disposable income. And that extra perk of free parking is enough to get them just to stay a little bit longer to eat and shop. And I think the sales tax is gained by them shopping around the square is probably a little bit higher than just that single $5 payment. And some of them have actually mentioned, you know, if, if they, we did charge, you know, why, how, do, how are we different than other places around? They could just stay at home and go shopping there instead. So they choose to stay here for a little bit longer because we, we were a destination at that point. As Mr. Dunaway mentioned earlier, traffic and parking studies have been done for the city. One option that was put forth was a possibility of smart parking spaces and integration with an app to show utilization availability. Does the county have an accurate utilization count for regular daytime parking? And after hours could be calculated basically with sensors the same way that the road and DOT measures traffic that way. But if we do have paid parking, I would ask that we'd implement a graduated parking fee, utilize technology instead of personnel for trying to process payments at, at the entrance or exits, and have a way possibly to have validated parking for customers. Again, that could be something that could be negotiated with the city and business owners around who would like to participate in something along that. All of this is possible with today's technology and should be relatively easy to implement as hundreds of parking garages throughout Metro Atlanta have been doing this 
for many years in various forms. Thank you. The next speaker is Lynn Walston. Hello, Commissioners. My name is Lynn Walston. I'm a resident of East Cobb, District 3. I've been active in supporting the purchase of parkland and green space in Cobb, along with a number of colleagues. I wanted to thank Chairman Boyce and the Cobb County Commissioners for approving the purchase of two more parcels of land recently that will add to the county's parkland area. There's the site at 1101 Veterans Memorial Highway and a smaller parcel of at 6800 Henderson Road that will form a more than six acre park in South Cobb. Following the board's vote to issue the 27.4 million parks bond last year, the staff started with a list of 113 potential sites across the county to review. Commissioners and staff visited about 14 of these sites and eventually asked the county attorney to enter into negotiations with eight of the properties. The county purchased two parcels comprised of 94 acres off Burnt Hickory Road last month for 6.5 million and have contracts to acquire five other parcels. The attorneys are currently in negotiations with the owners of four other properties. The value of those nine other properties is estimated to be about 10.6 million. Besides these properties, the staff has ordered appraisals on three other potential park properties. Thanks again for your continuing efforts to preserve land in Cobb County. It's very important and it's appreciated. Thank you. The next speaker is Cassie Costoulis. Thank you. My name is Cassie Costoulis. I'm the general manager at the Strand Theater. I did send y'all a letter already on behalf of the Strand and board, but I wanted to talk about um, a few more items that weren't on that short and sweet letter that are just really important to consider. So I've lived on the square within walking distance for the past 10 years, and the square that was there 10 years ago is completely different than the square we have today. And I think that's in no small part to the impact of the Strand Theater. The Strand sees about 90,000 people a year come through its door. That is a huge amount of people. And a lot of those people are coming from outside of Cobb County. So we're not just, you know, taking people from East Cobb and bringing them into Cobb County, people from or Marietta, bringing them into Marietta. But we see from over 300 zip codes. So from all of those people that are coming in, um, those between rentals, ticket sales, that is about two thirds of the Strand's earned income. So you think a lot of arts profits about 50-50 earned versus unearned income. The Strand, because we were born in 2008, we function more like a for-profit than a lot of the nonprofits in the area do, which means we are very dependent on patrons. Um, so you take that two-thirds of our earned income and you and put that in jeopardy because, um, because of parking fees. That really makes a huge impact on the Strand and, and might also see an impact around the square. Um, I did want to point out a couple of things too. Um, the idea that, oh, other people charge parking and Marietta can charge parking easily because other groups do it. The fact that we don't charge parking is what makes us competitive. Um, and also, we are not only competing with groups, you know, like downtown Atlanta where there's parking or Wellstar where there's a completely different need than going to the square. Um, we're talking about people from Paulding County that drive past their O'Charlies, they drive past their Mexican restaurant, they drive past, you know, whatever they might have immediately around the corner in their pay, or in those parking lots that are free, and they come to Marietta. So we're not just competing with other entertainment centers. We're competing with, you know, the place right down the street. Um, so really what I'm recommending, and I think that we've heard a lot of this, is data. Um, making a decision based off of data. Uh, right now, what I have not seen a lot of is that data saying, okay, well, we have done studies, we've talked to parking groups, we know, you know, we stood out there with a clipboard for five Saturdays in a row, and we've talked to the folks at the farmer's market, and we know whether or not they're willing to pay that $5. Um, without knowing whether or not that $5 is actually going to cover or having some sort of predictions or, or any sort of model, then it really puts it in a guessing game, and that's just something that's hard to do when that guessing game could could harm Marietta Square. So um, some of the things to think of, the tiered hourly system I think is an excellent idea to consider. Um, 
charging uh, specifically on uh, special events. Fourth of July, I think a lot of the vendors would be a lot, or a lot of the businesses around the square would be a lot more comfortable with, all right, well, we have a huge influx of tourists this day. Let's charge extra on the decks for these days. Um, and, and if that could make a significant impact on what's needed. Um, also, stuff like, um, the square employees right now, uh, you know, at the Strand, we do pay for monthly parking, but we don't pay at the deck, even though it is directly across the street from us. And that is because we have to be a good steward of funds. And so we choose um, a different parking lot by linear parking. So if there's anything that I know within the uh, events business is that if you can't fill the house with full ticket price, you offer a half ticket price to get butts and seats, right? <laughs> so the idea of being able to have um, maybe more uh, monthly parking that's more competitive in the area for month for square employees might be an option too to really fill up those decks during the day when they're not full um, so i think there's just a lot of different options in there and, and i really hope that um, commissioners and chairman that that y'all really take some time to think about this and and see if there are some additional ways that this that this funding gap can be filled thank you so much the next Speaker is Ken Howell. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm uh, here tonight just to reiterate uh, from last month about the uh, Flex Bus um, service out in South Cobb. Uh, we rented a proposal for which we uh, want to change the service from a residential uh, pickup service to a fixed route bus schedule service in order to up the ridership as and to keep that service flowing out there. A lot of the depend, uh, residents in that area depend on Flexbus to get to work. The additional hours of service that we've asked for uh, are necessary. One, we need to start the service from inside the zones to bring the residents out to the east-west connector where they can connect with the 25 and 30, rather than starting it at 7 o'clock going into the zones. If you've got to be to work at 7 o'clock or be in Atlanta, you, you don't have a bus until 7.30. But if we started inside the zones and brought the, the passengers out to the buses, then the, the, the service uh, ridership would go up. And the subsidies that we're paying for these one to two uh, passengers per hour is, n is not sustainable that way. We're going to lose the service. Yes. So we're asking for those changes. The other uh, proposal that we had was on the flex, uh, concerning the transfer center uh, in South Cobb. Uh, the proposal that we forwarded to you, we might have been a little too quick on some of the proposals we asked for. We had asked that it house an em Employment Security Commission office as well as a uh, Family and Children's Services. We feel that it needs, after talking to Jim Willis, uh, it needs to be a multi-purpose uh, facility. However, what services need to be provided in there, we need to research that a little further. But we do want to make sure that you have the idea that it needs to be a multi-service facility. Uh, that's pretty much it. As far as parking, that's not one of them that's really on my agenda, but we have a parking uh, lot down at South, Co South Marietta, and on the weekends, we can use shuttle buses. One dollar, charge one dollar. We have flex buses that are not in service on those days. We can shuttle people back and forth from the square. I mean, works for me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Miss Burrell, Tar Heels forever, all right? The next speaker is Stephen George. Uh, 
Hi, it's Stephen George. Uh, I live in unincorporated Cobb County. I've been listening to a lot of things that have been said tonight, and a lot of them, you know, first of all, I think we all need to remember that there are no easy solutions to complex questions. And anyone who says that there are are either stupid, crazy, or a bold-faced liar. Now, having said that, knee-jerk reactions are oftentimes what we go to. The problem with that is knee-jerk reactions rarely make anything better and oftentimes make things worse. So ju just thinking about framing things from right there, I want to talk uh, about a couple of things. We've got uh, the parking. I'm, I'm not, I, I don't really know a bunch about it, but it, it, well, first of all, tell me again how the Braves Stadium wasn't going to make our taxes go up. I knew it was a bold faced lie when it was being told to me. Apparently, I was stupid and no one else believed me when I said that. Now, five years later, I look like the prophet in the wilderness. I knew what I was talking about after, after all. So I'm just asking you to listen to what I'm telling you now. This parking. Is the revenue that we bring in from the parking going to offset the loss in revenues that we're going to get from taxes at the, at, uh, from the businesses? I don't know. I think that's something to, re to think about before we do anything about that. Uh, the buses. I'm on the road in the morning. I'm on the road in the afternoon. I'm road in the evening. I have never seen a full bus. As a matter of fact, almost every bus I've ever seen only has one or two people in it. I have a house. I pay property taxes. I have a vehicle that I pay taxes on that I also pay insurance on so that I can get where I need to go when I need to go there. Having said that, I th it's hard for me to be okay with paying for someone's $6,000 ride from one place to another when there's only two people on the bus. I mean, how does it come out to? Maybe it's $300 for that five-mile ride. Maybe it's only 60 bucks. I don't know. Either way you look at it, it's a poor waste. It, it, I mean, it's a poor management of money. Maybe what we should have done is going towards a small minibus option. We bit off way too much with that bus system and we're sinking, we're sinking deep. Traditionally, what people do when they start having problems paying their bills, the first thing they do is they stop incurring debt. And all I hear is debt, more debt, more debt, more debt, more, 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 more debt. We're sinking already. Stop with putting us in the debt, okay? Then we got to uh, reduce our expenses. Another thing, I think the employees are very important. They are not more important than the citizens. Let us be very clear with that. Without the citizens, the, the employees wouldn't have a job. Maybe some people should be thankful they have a job. Lots of people can't get a job. And as far as we, we've got a bunch of buildings, I believe it is very short-sighted to be tearing down buildings when there's tons of money and grant money where there's a CDBG grant specifically designed to improve and refurbish buildings to be used for veterans and homeless programs. I mean, that, I mean the veterans deserve better. We can do that. That's something we can do. And with that, thank you very much. The last speaker is Robert Tuckman. Good evening, commissioners. Um, my name is Robert Tuckman. Uh, this is the first meeting like this I've ever intended. I'm a new merchant on the square. Uh, Robert Kent Art Gallery, and um, I've come to this meeting uh, not extremely well versed in all the issues that are going on, but I think I have something relatively important to say. Um, I get the issue that uh, 
we have an expense for this garage and we need to recover the money and it's the county's garage and the county needs to figure out how to recover the money for that garage. Um, and I realized that the Marietta Square is a very small piece of the overall business of the county. So it's not a small problem to uh, reconcile. Um, with all change, uh, there is this thing called unintended consequences. And it's the unintended consequences that usually uh, <laughs> where, where a lot of the disasters come from. Uh, so you think you're doing this thing, but then all these other things that happen, and several people here have already expressed their concerns about what might happen to the Marietta Square if we suddenly start charging. Um, the vitality of the square, just in the six years that I've lived in this community, has what appears to me skyrocketed. The number of new restaurants, the number of new art galleries, the number of new retail businesses uh, is up. And the whole image of the Marietta Square has gone up, and I think that that has a very rippling positive effect on the county, the state, et cetera. Um, so one thing that needs to be considered is the fact that the square is serviced by many different factions. You have county workers, you have city workers, you have various different kinds of merchants that are whether it's the Strand and it's event-based, or restaurants and it's a little bit more entertainment-based, or art galleries that's retail-based, or professional services. And in all those various different areas, uh, parking is a different competitive issue. Um, in a retail business, if I have to compete against a mall, I don't know any mall that ever charges for parking. And if I have to compete against the internet, there's definitely no parking. And so from a retailer's point of view, um, the access and cost of parking is a major issue. So, and it may be, if we look at the different factions, like if we have non-merchant based events, like the 4th of July that I heard uh, Cassie talk about, uh, that are positive for the square, maybe we have different uh, uses of the parking garage or ways to charge for it. Um, so all the things that I've heard about taking more time, maybe getting a consultant involved, uh, all seem like very intelligent uh, ideas. And I don't know all the events that have transpired uh, up to this point, uh, but the key thing is to consider all the different elements of people who are involved in the square and the vitality of the square in that decision process. Um, uh, the idea of validation that I heard, you know, different merchants and different factors might want to uh, have a, a ability to validate if there is a cost for parking. Um, I used to work for the Coca-Cola company. They, uh, somebody who thought it was a great idea to make more money came up with the idea of um, demand-based vending machines. So if it was really hot outside, you know, the cost of a Coke would go up you know, by 50 cents or whatever. Well, that seemed like a great idea for generating more revenue, but once it was really studied, the negative impact to the brand was so overwhelmingly antagonistic uh, that that idea was lost in very short, uh, very short notice. So just in um, summary, uh, I love being part of the Marietta Square in the short six months that I've been here. Um, I think it's fantastic. I think it has nowhere to go from up. I think this is an important decision with the parking and um, uh, just a lot of thought and uh, uh, good decisions uh, are, are, are vital for this. Thank you. Okay, thank you for all the speakers. Uh, we're going now to tab seven, which is the consent agenda. And I move to approve the consent agenda as is and authorize the execution of necessary documents by the appropriate county personnel. Second. Do we have any discussion? We have a comment from Commissioner Ott. I just want to comment on item number 14. Sure. Um, and it basically is a transfer from the Cumberland Special <laughs> Service District number one. Uh, to the transit fund for the operating expenses of the circulator. Um, there, I know there's been a lot written about the circulator, about whether or not the buses are empty, but um, I think it's important to note 
that the operations of the circulator is paid for by the $3 per night hotel fee and that no county funds go towards that operation. Um, so I just want to make sure that everybody knows that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a we have a second. Any further discussion? Call the question. And it passes four to zero with Commissioner Weatherford being excused. All right, going on to tab eight. Good evening, Chairman, Commissioners, Mr. County Manager. We, we have two items tonight. The first item is to approve a contract with Chatfield Contracting Inc. for drainage system repairs on Rustic Drive. Drainage system improvements is an approved component in the 2016 SPLOS Transportation Improvement Program. The low quote received from Butch Thompson Enterprises Inc. was reviewed and found to be non-responsive. The second low quote of $136,117.50 from Chatfield Contracting Inc. was reviewed and found to be reasonable and responsive. The completion date for this project is 30 consecutive calendar days from issuance of notice to proceed. We request the Board of Commissioners approve a contract with Chatfield Contracting Inc. and an amount not to exceed $136,117.50 for drainage system repairs on Rustic Drive. Commissioner Cupid. So moved. We have a motion. Second. We have a second for discussion. Call the question. Passes four to zero with Commissioner Weatherford being absent. Thank you, sir. Our second item is to approve change order number one final to the contract with George, Georgia Bridge and Conc Concrete LLC for bridge replacement on Little Willie O Road over Timber Ridge Branch. Little Willie O Road over Timber Ridge Branch, previously identified as Willie O Creek, is an approved bridge replacement project in the 2016 SPLOS Transportation Improvement Program. Construction of this project is complete and change order number one final to the contract with Georgia Bridge and Concrete LLC a savings to the project in the amount of $93,469.94 is requested due to variations between the original and final plan quantities. We request the Board of Commissioners approve change order number one final to the contract with Georgia Bridge and Concrete LLC a savings to the project in the amount of $93,469.94 for bridge replacement of Little Willie O Road over Timber Ridge Branch. Commissioner Bott. So moved. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Call the question. Passes four to zero with Commissioner Weatherford being absent. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jim. How's that? <laughs> Hello, Jimmy. Or, I'm sorry, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> That was good. Oh. You better put on your glasses. Jimmy. Hello, Jimmy. <laughs> good evening, Chairman, Commissioners, and County Manager. Tonight, I bring to you an item to automate both uh, Cobb County parking decks. Over the past two years, a committee of, of county staff have looked at every possibility of automating the parking decks. They have worked hard in looking at different proposals from different companies and evaluating what the county could afford to do. They also consider the financial success of both decks. The opportunity that's in front of you tonight is a great uh, one that meets our needs. Um, if I could have the committee please stand up. Thank you. All right, Cobb County currently owns two parking decks located at 115 Waddell Street and 191 Lawrence Street, which serve both daily visitors and employees. From 6.45 a.m. to 4.45 p.m., Monday through Friday, customers pay $5 by cash or credit card to, a, to an attendant upon enter, entering the deck. Employees pay for monthly parking through bi-weekly payroll deduction. And we also do have a monthly uh, um, parking uh, program for businesses on the square. A lot of attorneys and lawyers do take advantage of that. This fee of $5 was established in July of 2010. The new automated system would allow visitors using the deck to pay as they leave the deck by credit card or also pay at walk-up pay stations located in the decks. There will be no cash collection and payment will be by credit card only. This system allows a ticket validation process for the jurors in the court system and any other special circumstances that we may have. There will be a reduction in county staff that will be needed in the parking deck. There will also be the opportunity to have validation system throughout businesses throughout on the square. This also gives Cobb County the ability to look at the future fee structure for what we are charging to use the parking decks. Due to the debt service payments, the parking deck fund has not been self-sustaining, but has received a, a subsidy annually from the general fund. Both decks currently have free parking 
during the weekdays after five and on weekends. There are private lots around Marietta Square that charge $5 24-7, and for some special events on the weekends, they charge $10. There are many options for Cobb County to consider and discuss for future success of both parking decks. So tonight, I ask that the Board of Commissioners approve a contract with International Time Recording Incorporated in the amount of $90,371 for the purchase and installation of equipment to automate the county-owned uh, public access parking decks located at 115 Waddell Street and 191 Lawrence Street. This is a 2016 SPLOST equipment replacement project. I ask that you or, uh, authorize the corresponding budget transactions and further authorize the chairman to execute the necessary do documents. And I also would ask that you have some discussion around the free fee structure for our parking deck. Mr. Hutt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I make a motion, um, Eddie, um, you heard some comments and requests for um, data collection. Would you please tell everyone else what you told us yesterday about what um, you and your folks did to research? Uh, we did research uh, weekends. We put um, DOT, were, they put strips across our parking deck so we could get counts of what weekends look like. Um, we did that for um, two or three weekends. Um, we also talked to many different parking deck groups that told us what was going on around um, Metro Atlanta, what other parking decks were doing, um, and how they calculated it. Um, we spent nights and weekends here looking and seeing what, how, the, how people parked in our parking deck now and what filled up and what filled up around us um, to see the need for the, for the parking deck. Um, there's many different ways that y'all can choose to do this. Um, there's many different fee structures. Um, but y'all know what our situation is with, with what we're having to do from the general fund. Um, and now is the time I think we need to address this. Okay, thank you, Eddie. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chairman, let me ask you a question. Sure. Because I think the agenda item, the way it's written, um, it has the $5 fee in it, and I know we have a couple different alternatives. Sure, sure. So um, would you like a motion that... For discussion. Go ahead and make the motion. We'll second for discussion. Then we can go on and okay. make a motion. All right, I make a motion to approve... Um, the uh, contract with International Time Recording Inc. for purchase and installation of equipment to automate the county-owned public access parking decks, which is a 2016 sponsor project. Okay, and I'll second it <laughs> for discussion purposes. Okay, um, there was a lot of uh, discussion yesterday during the agenda work se work session um, about looking at a graduated fee scale, um, something you know where you have the first 30 minutes free to acknowledge the fact that there are some folks that will come over here and might have some county business um, that just yes. cars coming in and out. And then, sure. Let me put it up. Have them take yeah, it. One, yeah. Oh, I got that. I got it. Um, so I know I know the board has seen all this, and just for the folks in the audience, this was uh, some options that were um, presented to the board after yesterday's meeting. As you can see, um, each involves a graduated uh, fee structure based on the amount of time in the lot. Um, and so basically, I think that the board is probably agreeable to one of those options or some form of it. So. Okay. Commissioner Burrell, your comment? Yes, thanks, Eddie. I know yes. you and the committee have been working on this for a couple of years and looked at, talked to a lot of different companies and looked at a lot of options here. Um, but we have heard a lot of comments, both through emails and tonight. And um, I think the sliding scale hourly rate is a better way to go. I know that um, the equipment, if I'm if I understand correctly, the equipment can do an hourly rate and it can be adjusted based on, I mean, our direction. It can be, yes. So um, I think, well, I, I'm kind of leaning toward option B, but I think if whatever one is a consensus, 
Um, I think we can look at that and track it for six months to a year and then revisit it and see where we need to be um, otherwise. Yes. Um, the, the other thing that um, I just kind of want to get on the record is that this um, debt on the parking decks has, is ongoing. It, we've never broken even on this amount, and we've been subsidizing from the general fund from the very beginning. And we have to cover our costs. And I think t the least painful way is an hourly rate for people that are just coming to, you know, have lunch or, or do business at the courthouse. Um, you know, they'll pay a couple of dollars and be on their way. So um, I just wanted to point a few things out like that. And, Thank you, Chairman. As was shared, there's been a lot of discussion with respect to applying um, a fee outside of normal business hours, including the weekend. And um, in light of our county budget, it is a option that's on the table for us to to cover expenses. However. Um, I can say that all of us are concerned about the impact that it may have on the square. And we are trying our best to um, find a middle ground to address this. I appreciate the pay tier options that are provided. Um, I've also heard uh, someone on the board share an option for a flat rate of $2. And I don't know how um, far reaching that would be. At some point, I think this needs to be on the table, but I think it may be premature tonight to consider which option it may be. And I would lean towards approving the agenda item, striking um, the three paragraphs that refer to um, applying a, a pay or applying a fee outside of the hours that we already pay for until we have determined as a board which is the best option outside of this form. I, th I think it's um, a little early for us to do that in light of the variation of, of opinion that we have about it. But I do believe that we're all supportive of the pay tier option. Um, so I, I would be supportive of approving the equipment and then us coming back at a next commission meeting with a, a, a proper pay fee. Another option that I think one of the speakers here tonight and was discussed at our um, at our agenda session is to look at having um, parking validation so that those that do come to the square um, don't have to bear the full cost of coming to the square if a parking fee is applied. And I think that is an um, option that's worthy of consideration and, and from talking with um, our director could be considered with with the vendor that um, we decide to utilize. So I'm just saying again, I'm in I'm in a position to support the equipment, the automation of it. Even though it looks as if the win, the gains that we get, and Eddie can help clarify, it seems like the financial gains that we get come from increasing the ticket uh, or the. Um, from, come from increasing parking revenue because it looks as if the maintenance cost and the um, the annual maintenance cost plus the credit card fees are greater than the personnel costs. Uh, we will gain about $36,000 in personnel fees uh, saved. 36 um, versus yeah. the 18,000 that's here. Our employees that are in the parking deck are part are part time employees. Uh, currently so okay I see here mm -hmm. decrease in personnel cost through attrition are approximated at 18,000 annually this mm -hmm. is per position so yes. it will be 36 okay mm -hmm. okay so we would still come out um, in, in the black so yeah. to speak if um, we were to use the machines versus having the employee 
Except for the debt service payment that we have to Except pay. Except in the, which is how much annually? I'm gonna let Buddy come forward and we do have a, a chart to show you. Currently the debt service payment uh, is around $740,000. It escalates uh, by the amount of $5,000 to $10,000 per year, uh, capping out at $807,000 in FY 2029. The debt is retired in 2031. I have a copy, sir. That's, that's important to show. I mean, it's important, I think, for those that are here asking for us not to charge to see the significance of that gap that we um, that, that we have to cover every year. It is not slight. No, ma'am. It is not. No, ma'am. And, and by all means, the debt service component of the expenditures is what's driving us into the red. So we have, uh, we have this is our debt service chart. This is the annual interest in principal by fiscal year. As you can see, the debt service payments initiated in FY 2011, uh, and as we continue to scroll down, they end in FY 2031. It was a 20-year okay. uh, debt issuance, and it caps out again in FY 29 with an annual cost of $807,000. Okay, with the fees that could be applied um, through this agenda item, what are we looking at? What, what kind of return are we looking at annually? Well, as, as it stands right now, we're currently losing anywhere between $320,000 to $360,000 a year mm -hmm. based on the current fee structure with the current uh, number of parking, both from the public and uh, the private sector. So uh, what we're hoping is that the initiation of the, the new fee structures will bring us out of this whole and allow us to cover the debt service payments. Okay. And what are we approximating for the fees that will be provided? How much would that bring in annually? I, well, I think we had a conservative estimate in the agenda item, Eddie. What, what was the? $5,000. Yeah, and again, that was based on a conservative assumption using the $5 flat rate. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was $5,000 per weekend. Again, yeah. um, that was based on the on the flat rate of $5. When it comes to a tiered rate, um, I can tell you that we had a Lanier study done a few years back, and they estimated, based on traffic flows, uh, that it would be approximately $860,000 uh, per annum based on uh, their assumptions. Now, their assumptions had a few caveats. There was mm -hmm. additional paid parking around the square that would go in force at the same time. So using that estimate as a baseline of $860,000, Given the current debt service and the operations, we still wouldn't. I mean, it would it would it would still put us in a precarious situation, but it would certainly be beneficial. But again, those are estimated numbers, um, and we would have to wait and see how consumers respond to uh, charging the deck. But again, it would certainly be beneficial. Yeah. Okay. Um, Buddy or Eddie, to. To get approval tonight to purchase the equipment for both decks, the two automated in each deck and the other stand, standalone for walking up to, are, are there three in each deck? There's there's two, uh, there's one in this deck and two in that deck. Okay. Okay. Um, to to uh, if that gets approved tonight and ordered what's the time frame of installing it and when would these fees go into effect it would be um, installed in the month of december and be ready for operation by january the 8th okay when was it installed? and and yesterday when um i brought up about the businesses given a discount or validating to offset the cost of parking, if that's an option. Um, would the, the machines be able to do that? The vendor, the, the vendor, we talked to the vendor today, and the vendor said there would be possibilities to be able to work with different folks on the square if they wanted to do a program like that. Okay. 
Okay. And it's basically, a, it, it is a it is another ticket system to where, um, let's say a restaurant, they would buy a certain amount of tickets to give to their folks that came to their restaurant to be able to validate their parking. And we could decide what percent that is. We could decide that that's 50%, if that's whatever, but that's what the restaurant would have to pay to be able to do that. So yes, there's a program that does do that. Well, I think we would need to get with the downtown development authority and the businesses to you know see who wants to sure. participate and how yeah. that would w all work i guess yes. but it is an option it is an option and yes, something that we can work on yes mm -hmm. um so time frame i i can this be the way i know there was discussion yesterday yeah, about march it. you can do it to later if you want Part of february or march yeah. maybe starting it to, to get the uh, to do the proper advertising and marketing stuff you yeah to and to get everything but what we would do is we'd put the equipment in and we would just keep the fees as they are today. Um, and that's how the parking date would operate until you did decide okay. on what you would like to do. Yeah, I, I got a different take on this. Um, I'm looking at the different options. I think option C is a little bit too high. Um, do we know on average how long folks stay in, in the deck? What, what we have seen is um, three hours. It's according to what events going on on the square. If there's a, let's say on a Saturday, there's a, um, there's an art event going on in the square, they could be there three to four hours or some have stayed even longer. Uh, if it's a going to the restaurant, going to a restaurant and back to their car, it's about two hours. Okay. Um, and here's where I'm going, Mr. Chairman. Option A, based on what the time frames that Eddie just talked about, option A is going to generate less money on a daily basis than the current $5. Right. Because folks are, you know, if you just look at how it's broken down. So like I said, I think option C is too high. Option A is, is not going to work. Mm -hmm. It's too low. Um, well, I'm going to amend my motion to include the um, approval part and approve the option B fee structure for six months. Because I do not believe that we can, without having something actually in place where people actually have to pay, I do not think we're going to get a valid indication of exactly how the deck's going to be used. Um, everything else is a guess. So it's my belief that what we need to do is put the equipment in, do option B for six months, have um, Eddie and, and folks come back to this board in six months with actual numbers, because once the equipment's in, we'll be able to know how much you know the deck is being used. Um, and we can look to see, because it may be that the two to five hours is not covering what we're making today. And so I just think that we need to have something that moves forward with people actually having to pay, but at the same time, acknowledging that we may want to tweak it. So that would be my motion that we approve the agenda item with option B, but for six months with um, staff to come back to the board um, for final approval of a final payments plan. Would you be and an effective date? Yeah, would you be willing to start this in February so we have 60 days to market this plan? I think it's very important mm -hmm. that. All right, so let's just, we'll start at February 1st. Right. And I just like to do one thing to respond because I just I think it's important that people uh, understand that we spent a lot of time on this issue. We've been taking take it lightly. Uh, I was at a meeting last night and somebody recommended I look at a, a Lanier study. And believe it or not, we did one. He needs a study. Two years ago. Can you put that up there? Chairman Mike. Chairman Mike, Mike please. Oh, sorry. Chairman Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just so that you know that I didn't Photoshop this, this is the <laughs> second page of the study. It tells you we did this in 2015. Now, uh, I, we have really cordial relationships with uh, Marietta, so I'm, I was very selective what pages I pulled out of here because uh, Mayor Dunaway, uh, uh, what, didn't want me to use certain words, and I'm not going to in this uh, presentation, but these are some of the comparisons they made in the local area. And this is the sheet that really caught my eye. This is what the study proposed that we charge for our parking deck. It's at the very top of this, I'm sorry, the very top. 
Now, if anybody thinks that I'm, we're gonna charge $15 to park here on July 4th, you don't know me very well. Uh, there's no way to destroy your relationship with the city is to charge or something. But this is, the, this is the result of a paid study. And this is what they recommended uh, that we charge to park in the county garage. So if you look at what we have proposed as the option, I think you'll see that we have found a nice halfway point, a consensus. Because we have two two extremes here. One is we have an annual shortfall of $324,000 every year in climbing. And that's a $324,000 shortfall that we, we contribute to not just Marietta, but to the county by doing this uh, from, uh, from our, by operating in the red. So we have to find some way, because we are now at the point where we have no more cans, no more buckets to drain out of. We have to address this shortfall. It's a responsibility we have to the county. It's their money, and we have to show them that we're spending re uh, responsibly. What we're trying to find here is what I call a consensus or a middle point. What's a compromise between where the city uh, merchants are and where we are, where we are, and how do we get together? You know, uh, uh, how do we get to a common purpose together where we both give up some, we both lose a little bit? And I think the option B. Uh, addresses that very nicely because the nice point is is that we're going to get to come back in six months and take a look at that and you and I know if this doesn't work as you can see tonight we're going to hear you uh, we, we this board works very very hard to give every opportunity for people to come and talk to us and tell us what they think and you've already seen that tonight because we've already amended the motion from the flat five dollar fee the second thing I want to point out is that in fact, if you come to the square now during the day, you can park here for less than five dollars under the under option B. If you stay here for less than two hours, all right, you, if you go out and have lunch at the restaurant or go and have a dinner under two hours, you park for two bucks. All right? And whereas now, no matter what time you show up during the day, you gotta pay five bucks. And now we're gonna give you the option to pay two dollars. And I know Americans, you're gonna be here at one hour and fifty nine minutes lined up there. So uh, I hope that if nothing else we convey to you that this board heard all of you and we're trying to find a, way, a reasonable approach to this, but it also responds to the concern we have about our, uh, our, our deficit situation. So thank you for that time. Oh, I second. Okay, sorry. I second the I second the amended motion. Any further discussion? I just have some clarifying. Okay, questions. sure. No, Rob. No, Rob. No. Don't We're gonna leave it the way it is for six months. Come up. I mean, let's just hear the suggestion. It does not Good. hurt to hear at this point. Though. It looked zero to 30 minutes was free Correct. and then one to, it just looked, I, I think the intention was the first hour was free. No, the first 30 minutes is free. free. And then from 30, so it minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. So it should be hours. probably 30 to two hours. To yes, two, is yes. Two dollars. okay. Yeah. Can you put that sheet back on the screen, please? 31 to 2 hours, right. There okay, so that second line would need to be modified. <laughs> okay, so we amend it. Take yeah. three. Option B to read the, uh, so we'll just take the whole motion to approve the purchase. Approve option B to read the first 30 minutes is free. 31 minutes to two hours is $2, two hours to five hours is $5, five plus hours is $7, a lost ticket is $7, and with it to start February 1st. Okay. And for the staff to come back in six months with um, data. data on dollars and numbers. And is that, okay. is I that, second that. Is that six months from the implementation in February or six months yeah. from today? We will actually bring it back as part of the budget presentation so it, it'll it'll be around july or august it'll be in july. Seven, yeah. it'll be okay. seven months and then also um we have this agenda item that has other figures so how does 
the motion that's being proffered today coincide with the agenda item that we're approving? Do we strike any language that refers to the fine dollars? Right. Or does it supersede it? How does it's it just work? it's replacing sure. that the five dollars with the fee structure of option B. Okay. That was the intent. Can I ask one question? Sure. Can, Commissioner, can we can we ask direction for the committee or staff or who to work with the businesses on the validation process? Would and we that will be do the that. That'll be or? a part. We will we will put that as a part of our marketing program uh, of how we're going to do that. I I, I, I assumed that that was going to happen anyway. Yes. Um, and to answer okay. Mr. Cupid's okay. question, um, on the second page it says effective January eighth, which we said will be February first. Both decks would open at six a.m. Monday through Saturday and collect fees until eight p.m. At that point, uh, Sunday parking would remain free. Mm -hmm. Although daily customer fees would currently continue at a fixed five dollar rate until the automation is put in place, and, you know, until the February first deadline. So right. it, it's basically um, till eight p.m. every night, and then Sundays. So you pay your five dollars until February first with the machines, but then after February first, the new fees will kick in. Okay. But after eight p.m., the way this is the way it's written, right? After eight p.m., it's it's free. Yes. Anytime. Yeah. Okay. So, seem better deal. You get to start your events after eight o'clock. So, okay. With that, uh, I'll call a question. And it passes four to zero with Commissioner uh, Weatherford absent. So, thank, thank you, you, Eddie. Thank you, John. Okay. Uh, we're now going to tab number ten. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Dana Johnson, Cobb County Community Development, here to present an agenda item requesting approval of the county's 2040 comprehensive plan. Uh, for the past two years, county staff has been working diligently uh, to interact with the public uh, in order to put together a 10-year framework for our long-range plan and how the county will grow, attract businesses, invest in our community, and direct growth in the appropriate manner. Um, during that process, we have conducted four different public meetings, four different public workshops, four stakeholder committees, a public open house. We did four pre board presentations with you, as well as the board conducted four different public hearings to hear directly from the public as well. So our, 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 we tried the best we could in order to get as many opportunities as possible for the community to become involved in the process and uh, to have their voice heard. Heard. On September 12th, the Board of Commissioners authorized staff to submit the draft plan to the Atlanta Regional Commission. In the process of doing that, the Board also provided some specific direction on some revisions that they wanted to see as the second, as the, as this particular revision comes back forward for the Board. On October 31st, the Atlanta Regional Commission notified the County about um, our compliance with the state standards for comprehensive planning. In addition to that, the Department of Community Affairs and the Natural Resources Division of the ARC provided some minor comments as it related to some requested edits that they would see. As part of this agenda package, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the uh, staff in the planning division have uh, sent to the commissioners and is also in your, your package here a memo dated November 13th, where we detail each and every revision that was made in this comprehensive plan before between the draft that was made and sent to the Atlanta Regional Commission and what is in front of you today. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, staff would ask that the board approve the 2040 comprehensive plan, authorize the submittal of the approved plan and the resolution to the Department of Community Affairs and ask the board if they would authorize the chairman to execute all of the necessary documents. Commissioner Burrell. Thank you, Dana, to you and your staff and the public for all the um, meetings over the last couple years. 
and several of those um, I attended and they were very well attended and with stakeholders and the committee and everything as well. Um, I think the way that the, the revisions that have been made or make it a little clearer and um, and I support this, so I make a motion to approve. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Commissioner Cupid? Yes. Sure. Um, the appendices that included the district-specific um, matters, where can the public find that? About one quick second. Commissioner, I'm going to look at this to make sure I'm giving you a proper reference. Okay. Commissioner, if I may grab a document from there so I can answer your question appropriately. I did not bring all seven appendices with me, uh, but I can grab one right there. Yes, I just wanted it to be known to the public that that is still incorporated, however, it's in the appendices. Oh, yeah, data. yes, I'm certainly. Not trying to I, 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 from. The, the all, what, what staff has done at the direction of the board is we took all of the work program items and we put them together in a single appendix. So there's one location now. Thank you very much. There is, there is one location now that the public can go to to I see every single um, work plan item that uh, the board is authorizing as part of this. Mm -hmm. And to answer your question more specifically, the community work program, mm -hmm. which contains the all of the work plan items countywide and by district is listed as appendix number three. Commissioner, thank you for um, giving me a copy of your appendices with me, not bringing them with me up to the podium, which I guess is a big faux pas on my part. That's okay. And that's a living document, right? This is a living and breathing document. Every single year, the Board of Commissioners uh, has a January meeting where they make revisions to every aspect of this document. So at any time, the board uh, may request staff to bring forward a revision, or if staff has a professional recommendation, we will do the same with the board. Okay, thank you. I don't remember um, who made that suggestion, but that was really a brilliant idea because that allows us now to make this a truly living, breathing document that reflects the dynamic of the 10 year period. And we can go back amending it without having to amend the whole document, which is what we did in the past. So, uh, like I said, this is a much better, more user friendly document. And with that, I'll call the question. All right. Passes four to zero. Uh, thank you very with much. Commissioner Weatherford in, in absence. So thank you, Dana. Good job to all your doing your team. If if I may give a bit of uh, note to Mr. Jason Gaines and Mr. Philip Westbrook and the rest of the planning team who spearheaded this effort, as far as also every single department head who had staff who uh, helped uh, do, drive all of this, and of course our steering committee and community who came out and supported. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you for remembering them. Good evening again, Chairman, Commissioners, County Manager. Uh, we have one item tonight. We would like to ask that the board authorize an interfund transfer from the general fund to the 2005 SPLOS fund to correct an erroneous posting error from a prior year. Uh, as it was, we had two parcels of land that were purchased by the 1994 SPLOS program. Uh, in December of 2015, those two parcels were sold. The proceeds were recorded in error within the general fund uh, because the 1994 SPLOS program was closed at that point, the fund itself. Uh, the, the, the revenue should have been posted into the 2005 SPLOS fund, which was the oldest open SPLOS uh, fund at the time. This agenda item essentially corrects that transaction. So with that, we would like to ask the Board of Commissioners to authorize an interfund transfer from the general fund to the 2005 SPLOS fund in the amount of $141,153.47 to correct an erroneous posting in a prior year and further authorize the corresponding budget and accounting transactions. Uh, I make a motion. We have a second. And uh, uh, I'd just like you to make sure that that amount is deducted from Buddy's paycheck over the next three years. Uh, is, is that something we can do with our software program? Uh, I think there's an accountability issue here, uh, Mr. Tazar. And uh, I can see that your supervisor left town. He did. To, to he's he's in position. Denver. Okay. Yes. 
So anyway, <laughs> I appreciate uh, you bringing that to our attention, and I'll call the question. Passes four to zero. With Thank you, Mr. Weather for absent. Um, we have no more public hearing. Is that correct? Okay. And so with that, um, we have uh, Commissioner comments. Commissioner Ott, would you like to start? Sure. As we um, leave all the turkey behind us <laughs> and move into the <laughs> Christmas season and the holiday season, um, got a couple events to get that started. The uh, first annual tree lighting ceremony at, at the Battery is on December 1st, this Friday at 7 p.m. Um, join us for the inaugural tree lighting ceremony. Uh, there'll be many special guests, including Santa Claus and some of the uh, Atlanta Braves. It's a free event. Um, and following the uh, tree lighting, there'll be a movie, and I'm sure you can guess what it is, <laughs> How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Okay. Also, um, at the Battery, there is a Winter Wonderland Party Zone, which operates basically, it's already in place, um, until January 14th on Saturdays. There is... Um, do you want me to read this? Bring little snow boys and snow girls? <laughs> Each weekend to enjoy activities, dancing, and fun. I have no idea what a snow boy and a snow girl is. But anyway, it sounds like a lot of fun. There'll be DJs and live performances. So just go, and then we can all find out what they are. Um, the hours are from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. And then as we get close to the holidays, the same hours and close on Christmas Day. Um, also, and parking will be free for this event, um, at the, uh, you know, the Symphony on the Square will have their annual Christmas concert, actually it's at the Cobb Civic Center, um, tickets are on sale, and then finally the tree lighting at East Cobb Park is on Sunday, December 3rd, which is this coming Sunday at 5 p.m., and uh, Santa Claus comes to that, and if you haven't been there, it's exciting to see what you can do with a gator. And make it look like a sleigh. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Boyle. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'd first like to say congratulations and thank you to Keep Cobb Beautiful, the uh, staff and board at the Keep Georgia Beautiful Annual Award Ceremony this um, coming Thursday. Keep Cobb Beautiful will be the recipient of. First Place Affiliate of the Year Award, Waste Reduction and Recycling Award, and Second Place in the Overall Community Improvement Award. Also, the Woman of the Year is from District 3, Erin Mulgrew, and the Man of the Year is from District 4, Barry Krebs. Also, and they're both board members as well, um, the South Cobb Lions have received second place award in the litter prevention, ca prevention category. So congratulations to all the recipients and congratulations to Keep Cobb Beautiful staff and board. We're proud of your accomplishments, goodness, and very fortunate to have you as part of our community. Um, also congratulations are in order to our eighth annual Water Smart Water Art winners. The Cobb Middle School students with a passion for art and water conservation submitted their artwork for a place in Cobb Water's annual Water Smart calendar that highlights the value of water. And you can get your copy at Cobb County Water System. Um, the 2008 winners um, are Dulce Krisnan of Simpson Middle School. She was the cover art calendar winner. Shreya Sudakar of J.J. Daniel Middle School. Abby Lines and Ella Wildman, both of Simpson Middle School. Congratulations to all of you. And for more information, you can visit CobbCounty.org slash Watersmart. Um, the art place at Mountain View is having a show, What Could Go Wrong the Night Before Christmas. So if you want a few laughs during the holiday season, um, 
the St. Nick Cafe at the Art Place Mountain View will host a presentation. It's a retelling of the night before Christmas in which the narrator must deal with every interruption imaginable. The shows will be held on Sunday, December 2nd, I'm sorry, Saturday, December 2nd at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., 1 p.m., and 3 p.m. And um, it's at the Art Place, Mountain View, 3330 Sandy Plains Road. Tickets are $15 and can be purchased online. And Chick-fil-A will be catering um, meals for the program. You can visit tapmarietta.com. And also, it's that time of season to purchase your Christmas tree. And you can stop by the Lassiter Band tree lot from now until Saturday, December 9th, to purchase Christmas trees and wreaths. And the um, lot is open Monday to Thursday from 4 to 8 p.m., Friday and Saturday noon to 9 p.m., and Sunday noon to 8 p.m. It's located at the corner of Gordy Parkway and Sandy Plains Road in the public's parking lot. And all net proceeds will benefit the Lassiter Band. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burrow. Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Chairman. A um, couple of announcements. We have a winter drive that's going on right now through our police department and want to encourage those who have um, not yet donated to please donate gently used coats, winter wear, scarves, hats, and gloves to a nearby precinct. They are located throughout um, the county um, in District 2. That would be at 4700 Off Still Road. There are also a number of Christmas events that are going on now, and the Mabel House has its annual events coming up this weekend with the um, Mabel Tea, I believe, is this Friday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., and then there's a candy cane hunt for the family, and that's on Saturday um, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Mabel House, and also on Saturday is a Mommy and Me Tea, which will be from 1 to 3 p.m., and, excuse me, that is on Sunday, excuse me, from 1 to 3 p.m. There are a number of other events going on throughout the county and just encourage you to please sign up for our newsletter so you can learn more about them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cupid. Uh, the only uh, announcement I'd like to make tonight, and I say this uh, uh, with great pleasure, is that uh, I'm reappointing, uh, I'm asking all the commissioners that have their current liaison positions stay in those positions for next year. That's because of the new budget process. They have the insight, uh, information, and, and the continuity that I need to bring to make sure that we carry through this new process by next summer. And um, and I've asked Commissioner Cupid to stay as my vice, and um, and she's agreed. So uh, I look forward to once again uh, bringing my best game to every meeting because she challenges me and makes sure that I do. <laughs> so with that, we're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>